Good evening. Tonight, how two detectives stopped a car for careless driving and found themselves confronted with a shotgun. The secret life of an economist from the Bank of England whose body was found floating in a river. And the bizarre case of the killer, or possibly an accomplice, who's tried to contact the police, and indeed he may even ring the programme while we're on the air. Well, calls from viewers of last month's programme led to three arrests, two of which happened within hours of calls to here to the studio. And now in three other cases, new evidence from viewers has given investigations a new lease of life, and developments are expected soon. The detectives here tonight are hoping you'll see something just as significant. They're waiting now for your call. Remember, we have a new code here, 081, so it's 081 811 8055. And it's the same code for the Minicom Supertel number for viewers who are hard of hearing. Remember, 081. Our first case is about the tragic death of a man described by almost everyone as pleasant, charming, cultured and intelligent. A slightly shy man, apparently without an enemy in the world, Murray Erskine. Sometime last December, probably on the evening of Friday the 15th, he was murdered. The Royal Opera House at Covent Garden. Sorry I was a bit late. Not to worry, we've got plenty of time. Have a glass of wine first, shall we? Murray Erskine came here frequently. Indeed, back home, he had a big collection of classical records. He was also something of a wine buff. Back at his flat, he had a store of almost 500 fine bottles. Chablis Cru, Chablis, Sancer, Muscadet. Is the Sancerre the 87? It is indeed, sir. We'll have a bottle of that one then, please. Right, sir. Perfect. He lived by himself in a basement in Norland Square in London's Notting Hill. He was regarded as a quiet and pleasant neighbour. Most of Murray's friends knew that he was gay. Few knew that he also had a streak of masochism. That could well be connected to his death. Just around the corner is the Norland Arms. The publican remembers Murray being there sometime in November. Pint of blow and brow, please. Murray used to come in to the pub two or three times a week. Not every week, never at the weekends. No, it's 150, please. There we are. Thank you very much. Cheers. He often came in on his own. And on occasions, he was joined by uh, a young couple. It's late, isn't it? Mm. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Cheers. It was my impression that these meetings were prearranged. The couple, um, well, they looked like a professional couple on their way home from work. They were uh, both smartly dressed and would stay and chat with Murray for about half an hour. Shortly after the couple left, another man would join Murray. He would sit down and Murray would uh, get up and uh, get him a drink, usually a half pint of lager. Uh, I first saw this friend of uh, Murray's in October. And the last time I saw him with Murray was mid-November last year. Well, they used to stay for about half an hour and they, they would leave together. So, How's two days this? before Murray disappeared, he invited a friend Hi. round to his flat for dinner. Well, I'm dying to tell you. You know my friend, the Rhodesian? Oh, yes. Is he still around? As a matter of fact, he is, and he's coming to see me on Friday night. That Friday morning, Murray went to work as usual. You could almost set the clock by him, leaving for the city at 8.30 and returning home promptly at 6.45. It's not known if Murray Erskine ever reached his home that night. Did the Rhodesian come to visit him? Did Murray come home to change and then go out again? Did you see him anywhere that Friday night? The next day, Murray's access card and checkbooks were used in London's West End. Someone who may have had a beard went into Austin K on the Strand. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Uh, can I help you at all? Yes, can I look at that watch, please? Yes, certainly. It's quite a rare watch, actually. There are only 350 of those in the country. And how much is it? Well, it's usually 225, but we're selling it for 200 pounds. OK, that'll be fine. That's what I'm looking for. Good. Do you take access? Yes, we do. I'll just get this authorised. One cute moment. 
Okay. The name's Erskine. It expires August 1990. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Two days later, just around the corner, London's Charing Cross Hotel. Someone booked a hire car under the name of Murray Erskine. He must have had to wait outside the hotel for an hour or so since the driver had first gone to the wrong hotel. Hi, I think this is for me. Oh, you are from the end. Right. Sorry, I'm so late. Oh, that's that's the wrong place. Right. Don't worry. Um, if you'd like to get in, let's throw out some paperwork. I won't keep you long. Right then. Um, could I have your driving license, please, sir? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. And uh, can I have your access card, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Right, sir. Thank you, Mr. Erskine. Everything seems to be in order. I hope you enjoy the car. Shouldn't have any problems with it. Cheers. Last time. Bye-bye. Thanks. The delivery driver noticed the man sat in the car for about five minutes before driving off. During that week before Christmas, between Monday the 18th of December and Thursday the 21st, Murray's access card and checkbook were used frequently, always in London's West End. The red Fiesta was dropped off as arranged on Thursday morning, just behind King's Cross Station. From the mileage, the car had clearly been driven outside London. Several days elapsed over the Christmas and New Year period, and then here at London's Liverpool Street Station, Murray's card and checkbook were used again. Can I have fifty pounds worth of gilders, please? Can I have a five-day return ticket to Holland, please? Yeah, fifty pounds. Around now, Murray Erskine's bank had recognised his writing had been forged, and soon after this, his access card was blocked. When someone tried to use it Thank in the you. Netherlands, it was seized. The River Cam in Cambridgeshire, near Ely. From two days before Christmas, there'd been several sightings of a large black plastic bag that was floating in the water near this new pub, the five miles from anywhere. At least three witnesses thought it was a body, but no one told the police. Until three months later, these two were sailing on a day trip down the river. If you saw Murray Erskine on Friday the 15th of December after you left work or any time after that, please do call us. Laurie Vanner, I, I gather you've had a tremendous amount of cooperation, and particularly from the gay community. That's quite correct. Um, the inquiry has taken us into a number of gay clubs, pubs and bars, and in fact we've we received nothing but the best of cooperation there. We, have to, we do know that uh, Mr Erskine met this man as a result of an advert in a contact magazine here in London. We know that the man was into S&M and CP, both expressions, which members of the gay community will understand. And we don't believe that um, Mr. Erskine is the only man which this Rhodesian could have met. I have to ask you this. I mean, how discreet are you going to be if somebody rings up and uh, we sort of call a closet gay? Their family, friends don't know. We understand that people may feel vulnerable and reluctant to come forward, but we really do guarantee absolute discretion. OK. The couple in the pub who were meeting Murray sometime October or, or November, you need to find them. Obviously, they've got nothing to do with the crime, except that they might know who he was meeting later on. It would certainly seem that uh, their presence in the pub coincided with the visits of this other man. Uh, they may have seen him. Mr Erskine may well have spoken about him. Let's see we this uh, other man. What do we know about him? We've, he's been described to us as being in his mid-30s, about six foot tall, slightly above average build. Um, his hair is dark, down to his uh, collar, and he's got an indistinct accent. OK. Now, we also have uh, a video fit of a man who was seen uh, that's a description, in fact, from the hire car delivery driver. Uh, it could well be the chap who, who bought the watch as well. Not dissimilar. It's not dissimilar. That man was described to us as being in his early 30s, 5 foot 11 tall, about average build. Um, it's a well-trimmed beard and moustache with nice curly dark brown hair. Uh, clearly, we need to find anybody who knows someone who could be known as the Rhodesian. That's correct. Erskine referred to him as the Rhodesian or my Rhodesian friend. We only know from things that Mr Erskine told his colleagues that um, the man had served in the Rhodesian army, possibly in their version of the SAS, coming back to England after independence. Or at least he said he had. That's we correct. Know whether he had or not, presumably. Incidentally, this is uh, one of the Seiko Yachtmaster watches. 
Uh, there are only 350 of these in the country. If you know someone who's got one of those, particularly in conjunction with one of these, which is a watch cover case, and in conjunction possibly with one of these too, which is a Euro belt pouch, something he might wear around his waist, and then do give us a call, particularly if any of the descriptions match or anything else seems odd to you. Here's the number if you can help in any way, 081, remember the new code, 811-8055, 081-811-8055. Or you can try the instant room at Kensington, which is Greater London, that's 081-741-6022. That's 081-741-6022. Well, as in progress reports on previous programmes, last December we reconstructed the last day in the life of Christoph Schliak, who worked as a sub-editor for Butterworth's Law Publishers and had for the past 11 years lived in Shepherd's Bush in West London. He was a familiar figure in the area with his trilby hat, gold fob watch and monocle. On the evening of Monday the 18th of September, Christoph was stabbed and killed at his flat. A few days after the programme, a viewer called with information which has led directly now to one man's arrest. That man is now in custody, awaiting formal charge. Last month uh, on Photocall, we showed a picture of a man who was sought in connection with a rape near King's Cross in North London. Forty-three viewers thought they recognised the picture and two of them led police to the south coast. In fact, one gave the name of a guest house there. Detectives went round on the Friday morning pretty early. They were told the suspect was working at a nearby hospital. A man was subsequently arrested. He's been remanded, charged with rape. And there have been two more arrests also as a result of last month's photo call. In one case, we showed security videotape of robberies at two banks in the North London area. Police believed these were carried out by the same man, and two callers to the programme gave the same name. One of them gave an address as well. Police called at that address, and an arrest has now been made. And the other case was in South London. Again, we showed two pieces of security video. This time the robberies were at building societies. Again, police were convinced these were both carried out by the same man. And 20 callers rang with the same name. Several callers gave addresses as well. And on the Saturday morning following the programme, a man was arrested at his home. Well, now to this month's photo call. Here with the faces and the stories behind them, WDC Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher. These two men, Peter Meyer and Syed Almanor, may be able to help the company fraud department of the City of London Police, who are investigating a £300,000 fraud. You may know them as directors of International Sellers, the trading name for Shopdean Limited, operating between June 1988 and January 89. Peter Meyer is a well-known figure in the wine trade in the United Kingdom and Germany, and may still be in contact with many people in that business. He's sometimes known as Roger Cavendish, if you had any dealings with him or Mr Almanor or have any information about their current whereabouts, please ring us now. Colleagues in West Mercia are looking for this man, who they believe has carried out four armed robberies in three different counties, getting away with over £7,000. He's seen here on Monday the 5th of February at the Staffordshire Building Society in Bromsgrove, Worcestershire. Far away on the south coast in Exeter, ten days later, he was at the Nationwide Anglia Building Society on Thursday the 15th of February. He couldn't escape the security camera in Shrewsbury either. Here he is in the Abbey National Building Society on Tuesday the 27th of March. He's described as 20 to 30 years old, 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 9 and is slim with a pock-marked face. He always wears a cloth cap and an army style camouflage jacket but it hardly helps him to blend into his surroundings. If you think you know who he is, please call us. Next, colleagues in Lancashire would like to speak to this man. His name is Peter Preston, or you may know him as David Eyre or Peter Briars. He may have information about a number of frauds and deceptions carried out throughout the country involving electrical equipment and cars worth about £60,000. He was last seen on Friday the 5th of January in Beetham, Cumbria, when he left his rented home, taking his wife and two young daughters with him. He may still be driving a white Volvo estate car, registration G392GCK. Peter Preston is 45 years old, 5 foot 10 inches tall and well built. If you know where he is, please ring us now. Colleagues in the Metropolitan Police Flying Squad are looking for this man who's committed five armed robberies at banks and building societies in central London since January. The security film shows him in the Yorkshire Building Society in Maddox Street, London at 3.25pm on Wednesday the 14th of March. He handed the cashier a note saying he was carrying a gun. 
The next day, he did the same thing at Lloyds Bank in Piccadilly, but the security camera caught him again, and at the same time too, at 3.25. He's a man in his early 20s, about 5 foot 10 tall, with short brown hair, and has always worn dark sunglasses in the raids. If you have any information about this man, or were in the vicinity of these building societies and banks during the raids, then please ring us now. Colleagues in Hertfordshire would like to speak to this man, Gary Thompson. He was last seen at 2.30am on April the 10th, when he was dropped by a taxi in Beaconsfield Road, Walthamstow, East London. He just discharged himself from Whittington Hospital and was still wearing his pyjamas. He was born in Scotland, but his main base for many years has been Doncaster in South Yorkshire. He may be able to help detectives in Stevenage with an inquiry looking into cases of deception. Gary Thompson, or Gary Talbot as he sometimes calls himself, is 28 years old and usually wears army style clothes. He has damaged his right ankle, which is often in a plaster cast and therefore sometimes uses crutches. If you think you know him, or any of our other photo call faces, please ring us now. And here's the number, remember the new code, 081 811 8055. That's 081 811 8055. Well, more news now as a result of last month's programme. First, on the case of 16-year-old Michael Bolton, who inexplicably disappeared without trace a year ago while he was out jogging near his home in Eam, Derbyshire. We had more than 250 calls from people anxious to help, but the results have been disappointing. There are only 10 callers who said they thought they saw Michael in Eam on the day he went missing, and those are being followed up. But many viewers rang to say that they'd seen Michael in or near the village of Starport on Severn. The police have discovered that there is a boy living there who looks very much like Michael, so again, disappointment there. But there would have been thousands of people in the Eam area of the Peak District on that day. And police feel there must be many more people who could have seen Michael out in his jogging gear on the afternoon or early evening of Sunday the 7th of May last year. So if you think you did see Michael and you haven't yet contacted the police, you can either ring us here in the studio or this is the direct line to the police station in Buxton. It's 0298 72100. That's 0298, the code for Buxton, 72100. Some intriguing developments on the murder in West London of the businessman Surrender Gill. If you recall, he was hijacked in his distinctive blue Mercedes in Southall High Street, and later his car was seen being driven by someone wearing a motorcycle crash helmet. Mr Gill then seemed to get away. The next morning was found stabbed to death. Detectives now have two new sightings which might prove cru crucial. One viewer rang to say she'd seen a white car waiting in a car park just off South Road half an hour before the hijack and someone in that car was wearing a crash helmet. Then later that same afternoon, another viewer saw what seemed to be a car chase. A car just like Surrender Girls, racing and swerving on the wrong side of the road, pursued by another car. Again, a white one. We'll keep you in touch with what develops. Our Aladdin's cave last month actually prompted more calls than we could count. Police are still working following up some of the claims, but three items have already been reunited with their owners. A housemaster at Trent College in Long Eaton in Nottinghamshire recognised his old cigarette lighter. That was the one inscribed with the name Lang. He'd given it to a friend when he gave up smoking a few years ago. He obviously doesn't want to start smoking again, so every effort is being made to trace the friend. The lady's watch we showed with the inscription from Bill to Peg on the back has been restored to a grateful peg. And as often happens on Aladdin's cave, a sharp-eyed viewer noticed a long-lost item in the background. In this case, it was a vase, and that is now back where it belongs. We're already getting uh, quite a number of calls in on uh, photo call cases and also, I'm happy to say, on the Murray Erskine murder. So please, if you haven't been able to get through it, I'm told that occasionally people are finding the lines jammed. Please keep trying. There are detectives and researchers, not just in the studio, but we have many more who are answering phones downstairs. And uh, you can see pictures there of the downstairs room where there are another a whole stack of lines being taken. As always, your calls will be treated with the utmost discretion. And uh, let me remind you again of the new code, 81 811 The lines, if you can't get through at the moment, they're open until midnight, but do keep trying. Now, as a measure of the seriousness of our next case, that five weeks later, the two police officers who became involved are still suffering from the shock of what happened. One of them, an experienced officer with 12 years service in the Metropolitan Police Force behind him, is not yet able to return to duty. He was very nearly killed. Their colleagues from the Flying Squad in North London are now hunting two or maybe three volatile and highly dangerous armed robbers. 
In the film you're about to see, is there anything you recognise that jogs your memory? Our reconstruction begins in Palmer's Green in North London at a spot known locally as the Triangle. It's the junction between Alderman's Hill and Green Lanes, which is a main route to and from London, and it's busy day and night. About 100 yards away is Palmer's Green Railway Station, and just across the road, the Nationwide Anglia Building Society. It's Thursday the 5th of April. At about 10 minutes to midnight, a security van arrived to deliver cash. At the same time, the last train from King's Cross calls at Palmer's Green. Passengers emerging from the station may well have seen something of what happened next. Remember, it's 10 minutes to midnight on Thursday the 5th of April. For obvious reasons, we've left out some of the security details here. Drop it! Uh, OK. The stolen Cream Sierra drove off along Alderman's Hill. Unaware that a raid had taken place, two plainclothes policemen were just resuming their patrol. Well, that seems to go OK. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to the paperwork, right, though. I think it's going to be a slow one tonight. Yeah? Yeah, my job could do with it, quite frankly. Yeah. Kill a fox train, three on white. The two unarmed officers had been placed on night patrol all that week to tackle a recent spate of car thefts. Well, do you fancy something to eat? What time is it? It's just coming up to midnight. Uh, wait till we get rid of the station, eh? What the hell's he doing? It's worth it. Were you driving one of the vehicles which were forced to pull in as the two cars sped down Broomfield Avenue? Hey, wait there, police! Run! You bastard! You are the man! Bastard! I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, Act you bastard! Yes! Go! Go! You all right? Yeah. Yeah. The men disappeared into pitch dark waste ground at the back of a sports club. I'm not going in there. Uh, yeah, Yankee Echo 172, require urgent assistance. Uh, Broomfield Avenue, Cranford Avenue, shots fired at police. Moments later, two men sprinted in front of the traffic across Powys Lane from the direction of the waste ground. An alert motorist who'd noticed a lot of police activity in the area flagged down a police van to report the incident. My colleague in the car was shot at twice from virtually point-blank range. It was terrifying, thinking that he might any time be killed. He's still very shocked. He's off work and he's seeing a doctor to get over the trauma of the incident. Well, DCI Albert Patrick of the Flying Squad is heading the mission. Mr Patrick, when is the senior officer likely to be able to resume his post? 
Well, Mark is off sick at the moment. Obviously, he's not well. He's, he's still suffering from shock. He'll get better. Both were extremely brave officers uh, that night, and uh, very basically, the, the robbers were extremely dangerous. It could have been a member of the public. A very difficult uh, position they were in. Because he really did come very close to death. He, he was literally two inches away from being dead. This could easily have been a murder inquiry, and, and thank God it wasn't. Now, we are looking for three men. Do you have any descriptions at all? Three men, yes. Uh, they're vague, uh, best described as the, the gunman who shot at the police officer, six foot, goatee beard, uh, the rest is quite vague. One white uh, and another one black. So and the third same. one you don't know? Well, yes, exactly. Um, now, these men could have been in the area of the Triangle in Palmer's Green for some hours before midnight, before the raid happened. That's correct. Obviously, they, to plan a robbery like that, they had to be there for some time beforehand or information that they were, the timing was right. So we're appealing for anybody who saw two men, three men hanging about the car. Could it have been parked there for some time? Mm -hmm. did, did anybody notice it? What is vital is that the man who saw, the motorist who saw the two men running across Powys Lane comes right. forward. He hasn't come forward at all, or he didn't give the police officer his name and address. He is a vital witness, so please come forward. Don't have to say who you are, as you said in the night. Pick up the phone and just tell us what you saw. And he was driving a four-door dark-coloured Ford Escort. That's correct. And talking of cars, the gunman used a light-coloured Sierra as a getaway car, which had been told, stolen three weeks earlier in Kilburn, so somebody might have seen that during that time. Yes, they may, but one of the, the crucial points here is where were the plates made up? Uh, that's a, a good point, I think, and uh, we'll appeal to anyone who actually made the plates up. And there's a the number, B329AAG. That's correct. There are two other stolen cars which you're anxious to eliminate from your inquiries, or include. I'm relatively happy that we can eliminate them, but we just want to be sure. The maestro from Tamworth mm -hmm. was abandoned in Palmer's Green. Now, this was a maestro stolen in Tamworth and driven down to Palmer's Green and abandoned. That's correct. And on the night of the robbery, a Montego was stolen shortly after the robbery, or thereabouts, and abandoned in Tamworth. So it looks like a straight swap and the areas tally? Yes, they do tally, but we're not sure if they were the robbers. How much hope are you holding out at the moment for this? Sue, can I say that uh, we are struggling. We need help. Uh, it could easily have been a murder inquiry, and I do need just a little clue as to who the robbers are, point me in the right direction, and hopefully I'll be able to do the rest with my men. Let's hope so. If you can help Albert Patrick and his colleagues to trace these gunmen, please do ring us now. This could well be a matter of urgency. As we've said, these are dangerous men. Now, the number to ring here is 081 811 8055, or you can ring the police direct at the Flying Squad headquarters, and the number there is 071 230 2061. That's 071 230 2061. We are getting uh, a tremendous response, let me tell you, on the uh, Murray Erskine case. Um, we've had large numbers of people, and I'm delighted to say most of them being prepared to give their names on a confidential basis, who've given us names of people they think could be the Rhodesian that detectives are seeking. We'll let you know more as uh, we hear more. Well, now to Incident Desk with direct appeals on cases all over the UK. Here are Detective Constable Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher. In our first case, one of the robbers, or an associate, has left a significant clue for Crime Watch viewers. On Monday the 26th of February, four men broke into Heaton's removals in Baxter's Lane, St Helens. It was 8.20pm and they were to be there for nearly three hours. Wearing balaclavas and brandishing sticks, they locked up the night watchman and stole 12 of these Neff microwaves. They also took 147 cartons of clothing, mainly children's destined for market stalls, about enough to fill a small lorry. They left at 11.30 p.m. But just after midnight, Merseyside police received a 999 call from a phone box in Prescott Road, St Helens. It's pretty hard to hear, so we're giving subtitles so you can concentrate on whose voice it is. Hello, can I help you? Hello, yeah. you listen to me very carefully, please? I'm listening. Right, the watchman. He's transport. Yeah. 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 We think the man has a local accent. Could it be anybody you know? The night watchman had in fact freed himself shortly after the raid, so he knew about it by that stage. If you've any idea who the caller might be, or know where the microwaves or clothing are now, please call us. Next, police in Essex are trying to trace a man who has indecently assaulted three girls in the space of one week. The first attack took place on Monday the 19th of March at about 3.30 in the afternoon. Two teenage girls were walking along the road known locally as Road 50, near Stainway in the Langdon Hills area of Basildon. 
It's a fairly new stretch that hasn't yet been linked to any other road, so there was no traffic. A man followed the girls, then grabbed one of them, pulling her into the bushes. He threatened both girls with a Stanley knife and indecently assaulted one of them. Then he ran off towards Landon Link. The girls, only 15 years old, were obviously frightened and couldn't identify him since he wore a stocking mask. The second attack happened on the t Tuesday the 27th of March, this time in the early evening. Two girls walking along Lee Chapel Lane in the same area, Langdon Hills, were forced behind bushes. During the assault they were threatened with a Stanley knife and he was again wearing a stocking mask. The day before the girls had noticed the man acting suspiciously in Lee Chapel Lane. This time, of course, they were able to see his face clearly without his stocking mask. They say he's between 5 foot 10 and 6 foot, stocky build with a beer belly, about 25 to 30 years old, with collar length dark brown hair and has a lighter moustache. He speaks with a local accent and wears an earring in his left ear. If you recognise this man, please call us now. My colleagues in Staffordshire are looking for this man who, together with an accomplice, stole antiques worth over £12,000 from a stately home in Shropshire. Western Park in Shifnal, the ancestral home of Lord Bradford, was burgled on Friday the 6th of April. That's the week before Easter. Two men drove up to the main hall and got away with three valuable antiques. These two bronze statues of Venus instructing Cupid are ten and a half inches high and are worth £10,000. This Chinese ginger jar, made about 1660 and worth over £2,000, has the stately home's mark 105-4 on its base. The car they used, a beige Ford Escort A282DRA, was hired from Shard End Service Station in Birmingham a week earlier, on Friday the 30th of March. It was later found abandoned in the rural area of Redditch, close to the Young Offenders Institute in Hewell Lane. Perhaps you saw the car somewhere that week. Remember, that's March the 30th to April the 8th. And officers in Staffordshire think these men may have tried to burgle another stately home. Just half an hour before the Western Park burglary, a similar crime was attempted at Attingham Park in Shrewsbury, where a similar vehicle was used. This man is described as about 20 years old, 5 foot 10, slim, with a glazed expression. His accomplice is the same age, 6 foot tall, slim, with light, short, straight hair and a pale complexion. So, if you have any information about the hire car, the burglary or the two men, please get in touch. My colleagues in Essex need your help to find this man. He carries a knife and isn't worried about using it. On Friday the 9th of February, he went into the sub-post office in the Ridgeway at Leon C. Threatening the owner's wife with a knife, he tried to make her fill plastic bag with money from the safe. But at that moment, her husband came back to the shop and grabbed the robber. In the struggle, he was knifed in the leg and the attacker ran off empty-handed. He drove away in a blue Ford Sierra. Perhaps you remember seeing it driving very fast down this road. Or perhaps you saw it being abandoned a mile away in Satanita Road, Westcliff-on-Sea. Detectives now know that the getaway car had been stolen earlier that morning from this car park at South End East Railway Station. Did you take a train from here to Liverpool Street that day? You might have seen this man at the station. He's described as white, six feet tall, 25 years old, with dark brown fuzzy hair which was possibly permed. He was wearing a blue jacket with white or yellow stripes. So if you think you rem recognise him or remember anything that may help on this or any of our incident desk cases, please call us. And here once again is the number to call if you can help. It's 081 811 8055. That's 081 811 8055. Our next case is a murder in which the killer or an accomplice seems to have tried to contact the police. Detectives have a tape recording of a man's voice, they have samples of handwriting, and they have an insight into the suspect's personality, which it must be said seems slightly weird. Indeed, the police think that there's a real chance the murderer might call Crime Watch while we're on the air. If so, there are details that only he knows which will prove that he was really at the scene of the killing. The police now want to see if you can help make the pieces fit together and maybe fit someone that you know. The victim was an eminent doctor, a skin specialist who lived in Middlesbrough. David Burkett was consultant dermatologist at the Carter Bequest Hospital. 
though he also held surgeries in four other hospitals in South Cleveland. He was a dedicated NHS doctor who'd specialized in skin disorders for nearly 30 years. It will take some time to clear up. But anyway, I'm going to prescribe some... David was also one of the UK's half dozen figures in the field of paleopathology, the study of ancient human bones, and he was a consultant to the government. He was modest about his achievements and very popular in Linthorpe, even though many of his friends didn't feel they really knew him. David, from what I know of him, um, was a very private person. I think that was the most outstanding facet of his personality. He was a very kind man. He'd frequently stop to talk to people that nobody else would bother with. Over the last few years, we've got to know David a little bit better because he started to come out with several of the neighbours, my husband and myself, on a regular basis. On the Wednesday before David died, we all had arranged to go to the bowling club and David had gone to Durham that evening. And as normal, he came in about two minutes just before the quiz started. He must have driven very fast to get down from Durham. Yes, at I this did. Time, anyway. My goodness, it's cold out there, too. Yes. Is it really? It is, really. Yes, I'll see you in my Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start the quiz now. The first question is How do frogs breathe underwater? We know the answer to that, don't we? Yeah. Second question Where are the heights of Abraham? Oh, I know that one. In the group, he had the best intellect out of all of us, really. He had an outstanding intellect, general knowledge and ability. It's the day of his death, Saturday the 3rd of February. David was divorced and lived alone, and his routine on Saturdays was to go down to the shops. A virgin flight brochure, please. Right, there you go. Oh, thank you. Is it business a pleasure this time? Oh, a bit of both, really. I'm taking my daughter with me on a trip to America. Oh, very good. When you got your date sorted, give us a ring. That will do. Thank you. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Dr Burkett was seen in several other shops in Linthorpe and in Middlesbrough Town Centre before returning home to Cornfield Road. He'd lived here for 13 years, three of them alone, though he saw a good deal of his former wife and children. He began to prepare his evening meal and at about 20 past five, one of his neighbours cycling down the lane adjoining David's house saw him sitting alone in his kitchen. It was the last time David Burkett is known to have been seen alive. Nearly an hour later, at about 10 past six, this witness, a local farman, noticed someone sitting on David's next door neighbour's garden wall. David usually went out with friends on Saturday night, but by 6.30, he'd still not been in touch to make arrangements. I'll telephone, but there was no reply. At 20 past seven, there was nearly an accident near David's house. Bloody stupid thing to do. About 10 to eight, I ran to David's house and dropped a note in the door, asking him would he let me know by nine o'clock what he was going to do that night. And then I went down the side of the house where I noticed that the kitchen windows were all steamed up. I was a little bit concerned because I felt I could smell burning potatoes. An hour later, a witness waiting for a bus saw someone in the phone box in Union Street at the junction of Parliament Road. It's some 15 minutes walk from David's house. Someone from this phone box dialed 999 and implied there'd been a murder. The witness saw a man use the phone box three times, but only saw him speak once. He remembers the man walked away down Parliament Road. Hello? It's Frank. I've tried to get David two or three times on the phone. There's no answer. What do you want to do this evening? Well, I think we should do our normal and stick to our normal plan in that we go along to the theatre club 
And David may come along at quarter past ten. David Enjoy. never did join his friends at the Little Theatre Club that Saturday night. And the next day, Sunday the 4th of February, his body was discovered in his home. He'd been beaten to death. Brian Leonard, obviously you need to eliminate that man who was seen by the phone boxes from where the 999 call was made. Yes, we do indeed. He's 35 to 45 years of age. He's medium built, six feet tall, and he was dressed in a dark anorak. Okay, fairly distinctive features. You want him to call. It could be the man who died 999, of course, but there's no way of telling. That's right. He may well not be connected with the murder. Okay. But obviously we need to trace and eliminate him from the inquiry. Now, not only did someone ring the police, but someone uh, wrote this letter to you. Now, this is the, the first page of it, which is uh, stenciled, and I, I gather people who know about stencil say it's, it's f fairly well done. That's right. This next page is more interesting. It's got uh, a verse here, which seems to be about martial arts. Heaven and earth are my parents, psyche, tandem is my home, stoicism is my body. Very interesting, this line here. I can throw my life away at an instant. Can you? Yes, we've received many anonymous letters, but it, because of uh, the content of this particular letter, we're rather interested in finding the author of it. It's very important with that, that we find the there were details of that in this that suggested he really knew inside that house that he knew something about the Indeed, crime. he did, and the, about the activities of the doctor himself. And you think that the murderer or the accomplice might actually ring the program now? That is always a strong possibility. We cannot discount that. Okay. Obviously, whoever rings up, they'll be asked if they can give us details, which will prove they are what they say they are. Uh, a skull is missing, one of the, the skulls that uh, the doctor was working on at the time. Yes, this is a skull he'd had in the house for some considerable time. It had damage to the left eye and to the rear of the skull, and obviously we need to find that skull. He, was, he used it for lecturing purposes. He may have loaned it out, but of course the killer may have taken it from the house. Okay. And this bag was found uh, This in was the found house. in the house, near to the body. It was left by the murderer. We've checked and uh, with the occupants of the house, the cleaner, it certainly wasn't there before Dr. Burkett was killed. Okay, in itself not of course very useful, but if you can link it together with uh, other things. Remember, this killing is, is a very brutal and very weird one, and the killer might strike again. Please help if you can, 081 811 8055. That's 081 811 8055. Or if you want to ring the Middlesbrough local incident room, try 0642 300 200. That's 0642, the code for Middlesbrough, 300 200. Well, we'll be back at 11.15 after question time and there'll be more news on what's developed by tomorrow on Daytime Live shortly after midday. CFAX on page 618 has all the local numbers for the police, but the lines here will be staying open until midnight, so if you know anything about tonight's cases, please do call. Don't forget we have a new dialing code now, 081. 811-8055. How could you forget it? We've uh, compiled a handful of extraordinary and very ugly crimes tonight. Do please bear in mind just how extraordinary, how unusual offences like these are. On the whole, our society really is a caring and supportive one, and witness the huge volume of helpful calls that have been coming in tonight. So don't have nightmares, do please sleep well. Good night. Good night. Welcome back. We've been taking calls continuously on just about all our cases tonight, as far as I can tell. And we have more people taking calls than you can see here in the studio as well. Detectives investigating the murder of Murray Erskine have been inundated with information both here and at the incident room, and calls are still coming in. So, so far, an optimistic mood here. And of course, uh, it's photocall that always gets a good response. Let's see how good it's been tonight. 
David Hatcher, let's start, what, London Wine Fraud, that's how you start on the main programme? Indeed, yes, and no disappointment tonight either, Nick, a really tremendous response. First of all, we were looking for uh, Peter Mayer and Said Elmanor. Well, we've had sightings of them uh, phoned into us, but none recently, so anybody who knows where they are now, at the moment that's the least hot news, if you like. All right, what about, let's get hotter, what about the, the guy who was holding people up, robbing, and tended to wear a camouflage jacket, a combat that's jacket? That's right, yes, and he was uh, operating mostly in the, the Midlands area. Well, we've had a couple of names and addresses suggested for the Birmingham area, which looks promising. We've also had a number of calls from the south and southwest of England. So it may well be that we've got a connection down that end that we didn't know about. OK, Peter Preston wanted in connection with a deception inquiry. Yes, alleged sightings all over the country. We've even had sightings allegedly of, or one sighting of him using that white Volvo today. Uh, and also information about where that car might be now, and that's being followed up now. What about the robber you call the shady robber, the one wearing sunshade, sunglasses? Yes, uh, we've had a request to see that still again. Well, there it is. Uh, and that caller gave us a name and address, uh, and that's being followed up. But there are a couple of other names and addresses that could be promising, so we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed. Two of those calls, incidentally, are connected. Fine. What about Gary Thompson? Well, 24 calls here and 10 to Stevenage, and that's given us information about other similar incidents. There's also a suggestion that... Uh, Gary could be using the name Lee Edwards or Andrew Brown. Uh, but remember, he's the guy who went missing in those pyjamas and often walks about with uh, a plaster cast on his foot or crutches. And we've had a number of sightings that link in with information that we already had. But as you say, it all looks pretty promising. Sue. Well, now the armed gunman who robbed a security van outside the Nationwide Anglia Building Society in Palmer's Green in North London shortly before midnight on Thursday, April the 5th. Moments later, two plainclothes policemen on night duty saw a car speeding recklessly across a junction. Well, both officers have suffered from severe shock and one of them isn't yet able to resume his duties. Mr Patrick, you've been taking calls. What have you had? Yes, I'm pleased with the response. We've got a witness who may have seen uh, the robbers hanging about at the Triangle, which is good, and we'll obviously take a statement from him uh, tomorrow. Uh, we've had names put forward, which I appeal for, so I, I'm pleased, but keep the calls coming. I know you've had one particularly interesting call, but you can't give the details That's at the fine. moment. What you really do need is to talk to the motorist who flagged down a police van that evening when he'd seen two men running across the traffic in Powys Lane. Yes, he, he's a crucial witness. He may be able to give us a better description. Uh, please pick up the phone and talk to us, and we do need... We do really need to talk to him. Yes, if you've just come back, if you've been out for the evening, he was driving a dark Ford Escort, That's wasn't right. he? Um, you do feel, finally, that there is a degree of urgency in finding these men, don't yes. you? Yes. So they're dangerous. Uh, this, as I said already, could easily have been a murder inquiry. They may strike again, and it could be members of the public. So they need arresting, and quickly. Mr Patrick, thank you. Our next case is the murder of a Bank of England economist, Murray Erskine, who disappeared a few days before Christmas. Detectives have been anxious to trace everyone who knew him, especially a couple that uh, he used to meet in the Norland Arms in London's Notting Hill. Uh, and a man called the Rhodesian. Now, tell me, Laurie Vanna, I, I know there's been, in, in terms of volume, a tremendous response. What about in terms of quality, though? Well, you're right. We've had 80-plus calls. That was the last chance I had of uh, counting it. In fact, the amount of information here, I really haven't had the opportunity to go through it in any detail yet, but several of the calls look most hopeful. What sort of calls in particular? Well, we've had one. There was a name in the diary, one of Mr Erskine's diary, had a Rhodesian connection. Uh, we were unable to trace that man. We've had two calls that are possibly putting us onto that. We've had many calls putting names to the photo fits. Let's just have a look at the uh, video fits. That's the man who was seen in the pub in the Norland Arms. And we've got a video fit, too, of the man who hired a car in central London. And you've got names put to those. A large yes. volume of names, actually. A lot of names have been put to them, some of them similar names, and obviously all of which we'll work through. I saw an Irish connection that a couple of people put forward. Is that any...? That's great. We had one particular call that uh, looks most hopeful. They gave us the Rhodesian, a Dutch connection. In fact, they were very specific about Holland. And uh, also an Irish connection, something that we had been looking at. OK, this is the Seiko Yachtmaster uh, Sports 150 watch that uh, was bought on the uh, stolen access card from Mario Skin in conjunction with this, a mock uh, leather cover. And interestingly enough, uh, you've had very few calls on this watch. We've uh, we had a number of calls, in fact, where people have asked to see the watch again. Obviously, the watch is very striking, as you can see from the front. It is a yacht yep. timer, it's a specialist piece. OK, there are very few of them around. Laurie, thank you very much. 
Well, now incident desk, and Jackie, the first case was in St Helens, a raid on Heaton's removals in which children's clothing and microwave ovens were stolen. Any news? The officers here have taken 12 calls, and the incident in St Helens have taken 10. All these calls are giving possible names for the four suspects, but are yet nothing very encouraging. However, two people have called to say they've been offered the children's clothing within a five-mile radius of um, St Helens, so fingers crossed there. Right, could be a lead there. And people have asked if we can hear the tape recording of the voice again, mm. so let's have that. Hello, can I help you? Hello, yeah. Could you listen to me very carefully, please? I'm listening. All right, the watchman. Uh, he, he's transport. Yeah. He's got back to work. Yeah. And so, yeah. Tidal. If you think you recognise that voice, give us a ring. The next case was indecent assaults in Essex in the Basildon area. Mm -hmm. We've had a very impressive reaction to this item. Over 42 calls to the studio and they're still coming in, I'm glad to say. Uh, one extremely good one. I wish I could give more details, but uh, the officer's very happy about it and uh, perhaps there's good news next month. Perhaps we should see his video fit again. We have a description. Yes, his um, description is... That Suspects is that uh, they wear stocking masks, jeans, and uh, white trainers. Right. Now, there's an attack on the post office manager at Leon C, during which the manager was stabbed in the leg. Any news on that? Yes, so uh, we've received eight calls to the studio and six to the station in Essex, all giving different names for the suspects. Um, the information will be investigated, and one of them perhaps is our man. Um, we're going to show the, the fit again, and this man is, as you can see, is six foot, 25 years, with possibly permed hair. Perhaps somebody saw him on the 9th of February near the Blue Sierra, which was abandoned in Santanica Road, Westcliff on Sea. Jackie, thank you very much. Nick. Finally, tonight, the murder of Dr David Burkett, a consultant dermatologist at his home in Middlesbrough. It was a curious case in which the killer, or maybe it was an accomplice, phoned the police on the night of the murder and seems to want to give them clues to his identity. Now, Brian Leonard, I know you've had a, 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 quite a volume of calls again on this one. Yes, we've had result? a good response. We've had in excess of 50 calls, and many about the person who was seen near the telephone kiosk in Union Street. OK, here's the video fit. Let's just have a look at the, the person. Maybe quite unconnected with the crime, but you really need this man to call in or be identified. Yes, we've been given su suggestions as to his identity, and obviously throughout the course of tonight and tomorrow we'll be checking those uh, suggestions. Now, you were sent a letter which was... Uh, Possibly a hoax, but unlikely, since the writer seemed to know something about uh, the home of Dr Burkett and Dr Burkett himself. You've been able to identify this poem, and a lot of people rang up about that. Yes, and I'd like to thank the viewers for doing so. We've now confirmed that that particular section comes from a book. We've confirmed that. OK, well, let's hope... We're obviously hope. still interested in the person that wrote that particular letter. Yeah, OK. Well, let's hope uh, it all turns out for the best. Thank you very much indeed. Well, do keep trying if you still have information that you feel might be useful. The lines here are still going to be open. They're open until midnight, and we'll give you local police numbers in just a moment. You can always write to us, or if all else fails, you can tell your local police. And if you get a chance to watch the box at noon tomorrow, there'll be more news on Daytime Live and any overnight developments then. We'll be back uh, a month from now. Meantime, don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Yeah.